Can everyone hear me okay? Hi, Ashley, how are you doing? Just hanging out with Angie today. We're Come hanging. Nice. Teaming up on Tuesday, huh? We were gonna have Sarah Church join us, but she's got a closing, I guess. You, know, you gotta make money or something. <laughs> Dang those bills. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to get started in one minute here just because we have a lot of information. And for those of you who are with today, if possible, try and keep your questions to a minimum just because I want to be able to get through all of the information. And I want you to know that I will be sending out this packet to you guys as well. Um, next week, we're going to do more of a question and answer style that's going to kind of recap everything that we've talked about. I want you to bring your questions then. And then we'll talk about how to use some of the things that we've learned in showing homes with clients or, um, you know, talking, good talking points with clients to keep them from being scared, maybe of like maintenance type issues they might see in a house. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and then can you just let me know if you can see this? Does everybody see that outline? It says everybody can see it, but just want to double check. Yes, thumbs up. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> like that brick fireplace you got going on in the background. That looks cozy. Oh, yeah, I got it on. Yeah, nice. So I heard a rumor that it might be 60 degrees next week. Yeah, there's like uh, all the weather models are showing that the weather we're on a significant warming trend and they're predicting temps between 40 and 60 degrees. Go figure. I'm going on vacation in a week and a half and it's going to be warm here. Okay, well, let's get into it, okay? <clears throat> Welcome to Mastering the Components of Residential Homes Part 3. We're going to talk about exterior finishes, roofs, windows, and foundation today. So I'm not sure um, how much you might already know about this. I assume a lot of you know lots of things, right? You're doing great in real estate. I apologize if some of this seems redundant. But I want to put it all in one place just so we have some um, good tools in our hands and talking points with our clients and we know what to look for or how to tell what is what when we're going through homes. And then also being able to answer, you know, like the maintenance things that might go into order. Sometimes what are the costs involved in it? What are the pros and cons? Because every time that you go into a showing with this kind of information, you automatically stand out as the expert. Okay, so today, first thing we're gonna talk about is siding. Um, vinyl siding is the first one. There are a, there are um, several different types of siding. This is probably one of the most common. I think everybody knows how to tell vinyl siding apart from other types of siding. It's got more of a plastic look to it. It comes in a lot of different textures. Um, oftentimes it can imitate wood. The pros are that it's cost effective and low maintenance, and then it does come in a variety of styles. Um, it is prone to cracking and melting under temperature. So I'm sure all of you have shown a property at some point where a barbecue grill was put too close to the siding and it's all warped. Some people might see that and freak out and think it means they have to reside the whole house. Well, here's the good news about vinyl siding is it's very easy to replace just certain panels. And if you are not familiar with ABC Warehouse, in Minneapolis, which has all sorts of siding supplies and just about every kind and color you can think of, put that in your back pocket as a talking point for your clients. If there is damage to siding, that's a great place to find just about any match and at an affordable price. Typically, good siding is going to last 20 to 40 years. Here are a few different styles. Um, this one is pretty common. I don't think this, this particular set of photos does not have traditional lap siding. 
That's kind of your basic triangular looking vinyl siding. Dutch lap here has this little groove, right? So it has better water runoff. You don't necessarily get uh, some of the dirt built up that you might on just the slope siding, but you can get vinyl siding in just about any look. So just because you see scallops or shakes on a house today doesn't mean that that's necessarily made of wood. It might very well be vinyl siding. Hardy board siding. This is really great siding. It can last over 50 years. Um, it looks like wood. It's uh, Hardy board is a brand. It's really fiber cement or fiber board siding. Um, there's been a pros and cons to it, just like all sidings. This one's really durable. It is fire resistant, termite proof, and it can withstand harsh weather, which is great. A lot of times it's gonna have these wood grain patterns into it. And that's one of the best ways for you to tell that it is Hardy board siding and not true wood. Um, especially if you see it painted in one of these colors, because you can get hardy board in just about, or cement board in just about any kind of color you can think of. Um, it's higher in cost than vinyl, and it's definitely more labor intensive to install. And it's not always super easy to replace either. The biggest thing about this is while it's incredibly durable, it does require repainting on occasion. So it can fade in the sun sometimes, or, um, you know, if it's got like, you live in a farm or out in an area where there's lots of wind blasting, sand can sometimes kind of pelt against it or or dirt with high winds, and then that can just erode the color a little bit. Stucco. Stucco is surprisingly uh, got long life on it. And some people are really scared of stucco, and I don't think you need to be. Um, if you have shown houses anywhere in Minneapolis and St. Paul, you are finding stucco homes everywhere. It gives kind of a smooth, seamless look. It comes in a whole variety of, now they're starting to cut, aren't they? I hope you guys can't hear too much noise in the background. Sorry about that. They're doing construction now. Um, lots of different tones for this. And because it's technically a plaster, but functions like cement, it goes on, um, like if you've ever seen anyone, they'll use a lot of times the same type of cement tools on uh, applying stucco that you would see um, them using for things like sidewalks and whatnot. It can crack and it can move um, depending on if it gets wet and not or move with the foundation. That's when you'll see cracking and things happen. It's really important to check around windows for cracking with siding and make sure that they have the right channels at, that go over the windows for water runoff when you have stucco because you don't want it to get down around the window and underneath the stucco itself. Here are a couple different styles. And because of the fact it's more, it's, it is technically a plaster, but functions like a cement, you can get just about any kind of finish you want with it. This here is kind of a smooth finish that you'll see. Um, this one is a very plastic or plaster looking kind of finish. Uh, these are called sandpoint finishes and they're gonna have different kind of textures in there. Some might have a real grainy texture to it, like this one. Others might have more of like a river rock or um, kind of like larger stone type texture to it. But stucco can last for a very long time, even though it is a siding that does come with maintenance. As long as there isn't moisture intrusion, intrusion issues, you're good. Brick or stone. Now, brick or stone is by far the best type of siding that we can get. Brick homes are going to last over 100 years. Um, they come in a variety of patterns. All, all sorts of different colors as well. They're very low maintenance and durable. You do need to go out and check the mortar between bricks sometimes, especially around fireplaces. For whatever reason, if it's the heating that goes into a fireplace, if you have a wood burning fireplace and a chimney surround on the outside, um, just check that more frequently or have your buyers check that more frequently for mortar that might be um kind of coming loose in some areas. I'm sure all of you have shown a house at some point where a fireplace got called out on inspection because of the masonry or uh, mortaring at the roof. Here are just a couple different ways you can see that they built sort of intricate patterns into the stonework or the brickwork. It's very common as well to see um, combinations of brick and stone on homes and it is by far more expensive as well to do a true um, full brick or full stone home 
More often than not, it's common to see maybe like the front side of a house that's going to be done in brick and the back side that'll be done in stone or vinyl siding, excuse me. Okay, steel siding. So it's sleek, it's modern looking, pretty contemporary. It is fire resistant, water resistant, super durable, wind resistant as well. Um, it can dent in the hail. It might have um, some corrosion if it's in salty environments. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that here because we're not right on the ocean. Um, panels are kind of cut down to size and fit over the home's exterior. It's a pretty low maintenance siding. It might need to be painted though if it does fade over time and that does happen from sun damage. Anytime you have a, a type of siding that will require paint, it can fade in the sun. It's gonna last 40 to 60 years depending on the environment. And then here's um, a hint for this. So um, aluminum siding and steel siding look very similar. With aluminum siding, you're gonna notice that the pattern has less kind of, it's more of like these straight line kind of graining. It's not a deep imprinted pattern on it more often than not. And it's gonna have a dense sound on it when, sound when you knock on it. So I always go up and I just kind of knock on it a little bit. And if it has, um, sounds full or dense, that's more steel to me versus aluminum, which we'll talk about next, has more of a hollow sound, almost as if you're like squishing a pop can a little bit. So there's just a noticeable sound difference when it comes to knocking on the siding. Aluminum is going to be very similar to vinyl in appearance, but you'll notice here in this photo, it's got a much more detailed kind of imprinted texture to it. Um, it's installed very similarly to vinyl siding. It cleans easy with water. You can power wash this and steel siding pretty easily. It does, uh, it is prone to denting, right? So a bad hailstorm is going to put some serious dents in this if it's coming in at the right angle. Just know that. Um, and it does need to be painted when it's, you know, when it fades, but it can typically last 30 to 50 years as well. So again, here, just a hint for you, you'll notice like this has a much more detailed graining pattern to it than this one. And then do the knock test. If it has kind of a hollow sound on it, it's more it's more likely aluminum. Wood siding. So wood siding is a natural look. Um, redwood and cedars are the most preferred type because they're naturally water resistant. Uh, any siding that's put on the exterior should have some kind of treatment to it to make it more water resistant or waterproof. Pine is really common as well, but by far cedar and redwood are the most preferred just for their um, natural water resistance. It's, you know, wood siding can be beautiful. I chose to put a couple pictures up here that are not beautiful because my guess is you've shown wood houses before and your clients will have questions on how do I fix this, right? So up here, this looks like a woodpecker hole. Woodpeckers love, love wood siding, unfortunately. That's a situation where you're going to have to replace board by board, but it can definitely get done. Wood siding is not going to last as long as some of these other resistance sidings. So if you have clients that want the look of wood, but don't want to have to do the maintenance that goes along with it, um, cement board might be a better option for them. Does require regular painting. Um, it can be prone to peeling and chipping paint on the outside. It can also be prone to uh, water wicking, even if it's been treated after a while. So down here, um, you can see an example of like some algaes and things that have built up built up on this particular siding. Anytime that you have wood siding, one thing that I look for during showings is to see how far off of the grade is it. When I'm looking around the perimeter of the house, you do not want wood siding to come in close contact with the ground because it will naturally, as it gets wet, wick that water up into it. And that's why you have uh, a lot of times you're seeing the most amount of rot right down here around kind of the base of the siding where it meets the ground. This is an example of pine wood siding on an outside of a building or home. Okay, let's talk about types of roofs. What page am I on here? So um, I'm going to email this out to everybody again as well. I wanted to put some charts or graphs in here that just make it easier for you as a reference guide if you need it. You can certainly look this over and just keep the materials and study or become familiar with them um, at your convenience. I would say for sure the most common types of roofs that we see in Minnesota are the gable roof here. Very much kind of like your A-frame style roof. Why did it do that? Sorry about that. 
um, A-frame style roof, then your hip roof, where you have four peaks that kind of all connect together with one ridge line that goes down the middle. That's this one right here. That's very common in Frank Lloyd Wright style homes. Um, gambrel, gambrel roofs, Dutch colonial houses that we talked about a few weeks ago, very common in St. Paul. They all feature a gambrel style roof like this. Might also be called, or you might uh, hear it called a barn roof or a barn style roof. It's pretty popular as well. Mansard roofs, you'll see this a lot in kind of freestanding commercial buildings, small towns very common type of roof. And then of course, a flat roof is pretty common as well, depending on the style of building or even like more modern type homes might have that or a sawtooth roof or a skillion roof like this, where there's kind of the sharp angles going into those contemporary style homes. I would say the ones you will most commonly see, gambrel roof, hip roof, and or excuse me, gable, hip, and gambrel roofs. Here are a few pictures of that. So this is a classic gable, uh, gable roof right here. Nice strong A-frame, little dormer here that's also got a, a gable roof on it. This is a gambrel roof here. So you're getting kind of these pretty angles, barn style roof to go along with it. Very colonial looking style home. And this is a hip roof right here. So you'll see that you've got all these lines that kind of come up to that strong ridge pole or ridge line on the top of the roof. And then I put this in here because I wanted people to have an example of a dormer. So this is um, a dormer as well. If you've ever shown a, a house where it was like a one and a half story, St. Louis Park, Hopkins, Roseville, Burnsville, all kind of around the exterior of the city, you know, this typically was an attic space, right? And at some point, maybe they decided they were going to add this dormer here off the back, which is now going to change the pitch of the roof. And it's going to allow for a lot more headspace and living space in this area. So that is called a dormer, if you didn't know what it was called before. Dormer, I've seen. Dormer. I'm sorry, what? Oh. I think she was just off mute for a second. Um, sometimes you'll see these on both sides of the house as well. Uh, more common for me in, in my experience to see them off the back of a home. My dad added two giant dormers onto the house we lived in, in Minneapolis back in the 80s, and it allowed for full headspace in our bedrooms upstairs instead of having those sloped walls. Okay, let's talk about shingles. Hold on here, I'm going to check real quick. My friend plugged woodpecker holes in wood siding with racket balls. Do not recommend. Solid advice. Yes, don't recommend. And yes, Chris, I'm in the office. I've seen it done a lot of interesting ways, Colin, with plugging that type of siding. It never looks as good as just replacing the board. So, um, okay, let's talk about shingles, right? How to identify the type of roof that we're looking at. Um, here, we're going to go over a couple of the most common types in Minnesota. Three tab shingles. This is what they look like, right? We've all seen that. They have a uniform flat appearance. Um, with three rectangular tabs of equal size, pretty typically made of asphalt. They're lightweight, they're cheap, they're easy to install. But they are less durable, right? And they don't have the wind resistance that other shingles have. Um, your life expectancy on this is going to be 15 to 20 years. That's not going to change, even with a, a better built shingle, probably 25 years at most. Um, it's just nailed to the roof. There's uh, kind of a tar paper that goes in to, to protect the roof decking underneath it. And then ice and water shield goes up at certain parts of the, the roof as well to prevent any buildup that can get underneath and then damage the roof. More often than not, pretty typically, it's wind resistant up to about 60 miles an hour. Everybody's seen this style of roof, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah, it's pretty common. Okay, so three tab versus architectural shingles. So architectural shingles have kind of like this multi-dimensional appearance. They're thicker. They're definitely more durable. They're a textured shingle. It's multiple laminated layers that are built on top of each other. And because of that, it has a much higher fire rating. They also have greater durability um, to wind as well. So they're going to hold up better in a really severe storm here in Minnesota. 
Installation process is gonna be uh, the same, almost identical to what your three tab shingle is. The difference is that these can last 35 to 50 years. And um, this is a fun but important fact, right? I always look for this. If the shingles or the roof was installed after 2011, and I would almost say 2012, just, you know, cause we're talking about a manufacturer date here, just about every shingle that uh, architectural shingle that has come out since 2011 is now coming with a limited lifetime warranty. Meaning that, you know, set aside acts of God in the event that um, there was no hail damage or anything else, that's a 50 year roof. So um, occasionally there's going to be, you know, like a manufacturing issue or something like that, where there'd be a warranty, but very rare. So architectural shingles now are built to last. Wind resistance up to 120 miles per hour. And I want you to think about this when you're showing homes and you're pointing things out like this, that if the disclosure says that the roof is 10 years old, that's not a big deal when it comes to something like this. As long as the roof is in good condition, it's gonna last 40, 50 years. Please make sure that you let your clients know that this is a, a really good roof. And even though it's 10 years old, there's tons of life left in it. Cedar Shakes. If you have toured properties in some of the golf club neighborhoods that come with HOAs, you may have noticed that every single one of those homes has Cedar Shakes for a roof. This is actually pretty common in a few neighborhoods in Eden Prairie as well. And that is because the HOA mandates that they have the same style of roof aesthetically for the neighborhood. Um, Cedar Shakes will give you know your house a nice kind of rustic appeal to it. A luxury associations, again, might require that type of roofing. Um, that it's eco-friendly. It does require some maintenance to prevent rot. But again, cedar is naturally water-resistant wood. It does need to be cleaned. So sometimes you'll see the roofs have like algae looking stains on it. And there are tabs that you can put right here under the ridge line. If you ever see staining on roofs, even asphalt roofs, just know that there is ways to clean that. There are these little tabs you can put or cleaner you can put along the ridge line that when it rains will kind of run off and soak the roof and clean it for you. With proper maintenance, these type of roofs can last 30 to 40 years. And here's the amazing thing. Cedar shakes are wind resistant up to 245 miles per hour. So if someone is looking at a house with cedar shakes roofs and they think, man, that's gonna be a ton of maintenance or it's not a good quality roof. It actually has some of the highest wind resistance out of any style of roof. And if you have a buyer purchasing a house with a cedar shake roof and they wanna have a roof inspection done, there's there are only like one or two companies in the Twin Cities that actually work on cedar shake roofs so we can help get that resource. Mm, that's a great idea. I actually think it'd be nice to put um, maybe uh, an updated list of resources like that together for the team, Nicole. So let me know who that is, or we can talk about doing something like that for everybody. Okay, metal roofing. I do see this a lot in Minnesota. I used to live in a small town called Jackson down off I-90, closer to the Iowa and South Dakota borders. Metal roofs were much more common because of the high wind resistance right off the jet stream there and also it's in the middle of farm country, right? So um, there's definitely benefits to metal roofs. They're popping up more around the Metro, but not like necessarily in it. I would say with acreage properties, it might be more common. And then a lot of the solar shingles now are actually metal shingles as well. They're made to look like asphalt, but they're metal. Super durable, energy efficient, low maintenance, fire resistant, all good things, right? Higher cost to put in, Definitely noisy when it rains and when it hails. Minimum maintenance required. You definitely um, need someone who's specialized in installing that type of roof system as well, but it can last 40 to 70 years depending on the material and it's wind resistant up to 180 miles per hour. Now here's just a couple different styles. You can see that here, this is made more to look like a shingle appearance. And the new solar ones look even more like arch architectural shingles um, versus this, which is just kind of a, a ridged slope roof. Soffit fascia and gutters. Does everybody know what this is when they're looking at a house? OK, 
Okay, so let's, I'm gonna scroll through the pictures here real quick and show you what this is. So under here is what your soffit is. This is, um, this is usually metal, not vinyl, uh, but this is where you're gonna get all your venting that goes up into the roof to keep your roof nice and dry for airflow. So this under area here on the eave, and the eave is this portion of the roof that comes out over the house itself. This is where your soffit is. There's different types of, of maintenance that go with it, but again, um, it's there to prevent animal infestation, water damage, and air circulation in the attic. Fascia is this, is this board that kind of finishes here along the ridges of the house or the front kind of plates of a house. Soffit again, what goes underneath it? This is fascia. And sometimes this can get damaged by, you know, if a tree is close to a house and it whips against it, you might see some damaging on this where they can replace one board at a time and that's good. Um, but it definitely helps with make, making sure that water stays out of a property and protecting the overall integrity of the roof. And when gutters are attached, gutters are attached oftentimes to this front kind of face plate here on the fascia as well. So this would be fascia, this would be soffit in this photo. Let's talk about gutters for a minute, right? So we know what gutters are. They're a channel that kind of goes along the edge of the roof. All sorts of different materials they could be made with. Sometimes they're plastic, sometimes they're vinyl, sometimes they're aluminum. Um, whenever you're getting quotes on this, they're measured in linear foot, just so you know. So it's priced per foot when you're having installation done. And then you wanna make sure maintenance wise that the gutters are always free of debris. If you have a client who's looking at a house that has a lot of tree overhang, I would be looking or recommending um, for gutter guards. You don't want the leaves to kind of clog those up all the time. And then also look for ice damming at certain points, right? Like maybe that's an insulation issue on the attic. If you see ice damming, in some of the gutters. And then one of the biggest things, which is why I chose this picture here, is like make sure that there are proper downspouts on the gutter systems. When you're looking around houses with your clients, I'm looking for something like this. This downspout ends right here on the concrete. You can see how the pad has lifted on one side and it's sinking on the other. This water is running right back along the foundation wall here or the edge of the driveway. This ultimately can lead to flooding in a basement and it's what causes lifting here on concrete because of the expansion and contraction that happens with the freeze thaw effect. So water gets down in there, just like potholes on a city road, right? Goes down inside, it will freeze and expand, thaw and retract, back and forth, back and forth, and that pushes the ground up. And this is where you can get a lot of damage around the exterior of a property. It's always good to have um, either a drain tile system that this would funnel into down under the sidewalk or um, a six foot downspout that crosses and pulls water away from the property. So keep an eye on those things when you're doing showings with your clients. I'm gonna check that real quick. Chris Kavalik saying cedar shakes are expensive. How about insurance concerns on longevity and insurability of architectural shingles? I would say you're gonna have lower cost with the higher integrity shingle that you have on there, Johnny. Okay, um, moving on to windows. There is so much information about windows, guys. Um, I put in some definitions here for you, and then we're gonna look through some photos as well. So single pane, one layer of glass. Double pane, two layers of glass with space in between, typically filled with like an argon gas that allows for energy efficiency. Triple pane is, is just three panes of gas with two different spaces that are gonna be filled. And that's the highest level of insulation you can get on a window. Most common frames here in Minnesota are vinyl and wood. Wood is kind of transitioning out and we're seeing a lot of windows being replaced with vinyl, uh, wood, vinyl window frames or what's really on the rise is fiberglass. I didn't put anything in here about fiberglass, but I mean, I, I probably will tweak this at some point to add it. Fiberglass gives you the look of wood and it's very um, insulating and very durable as well. Vinyl is probably the most common that we're seeing now. 
and then aluminum as well. So they're pretty strong frames. They're lightweight. Um, we're seeing a lot of black windows that are aluminum windows now as well. And they're more resistant to warping, which is good. Here's a few kind of photos to highlight the difference between a dual, a single, a double, and a triple pane window. And these two spaces here that are usually filled with an argon gas that give maximum energy efficiency on a window. You see a house that has triple pane windows in it? Very efficient. This is an example of a wood window. You can see the sash and the frame is all wood. Um, they have a tendency to rot more easily. They get a water wicking. Condensation builds up on them can cause all of the trim to bubble. If you've ever seen that or molding that gets into window frames where you've got to sand it down, restain it and seal it. Happens a lot with wood windows. Aluminum windows here, again, very durable, less prone to warping. Um, stylistically, it's common to see these in black now. And then vinyl windows. Um, I would say this is the most common type of window, new window and window replacement that we see in Minnesota. Plastic windows. Now I will say this about vinyl windows. Anytime I'm showing properties and I'm looking at vinyl windows, I wanna see if they've done weather stripping in them, which is the edging that goes around the frame and the sash of the window to keep out drafts. Because it's plastic, it can bow out a little bit with the weather, especially as houses settle if they're um, more like newly constructed. So just look for that because that can allow for a lot of airflow to come in through the window. And I, I like to point things like that out to my clients, either as an opportunity to build some further maintenance into a home, or if it's really well installed and it already has that weather stripping in it, I'm pointing that out too. Okay, single hung windows. We're gonna talk about a few different styles of window now. So what are single hung windows? It's where one sash is movable and the other is not. So they're affordable, traditional in appearance. They're a little bit harder to clean because you can't move this upper level window down. Um, a lot of times you're doing, you're hiring someone to clean windows on the outside of your house or you're climbing a ladder to do it yourself. They're a lower cost though. So here's an example. See the sash here? This part moves up and down. And then this part back here is built stationary into the window. What is double hung? Double hung is the opposite. Both the upper and the lower parts move. They're easier to clean. A lot of times they'll have tip outs on them. So you can pull the windows inside and out um, to clean right from the convenience of whatever room you're in. You'll be able to tell because a lot of times they'll have little tabs here at the top to show that they can pull down and they're on a movable track. And, or they will have like a little bar that goes across the top, almost like a little grab bar for pulling the window down itself. And then in order to keep that locked up in place, the window has to be locked so you're gonna have a mechanism here and one on the upper part of the window as well, just kind of keeping them in place. A Little bit better than single hung windows, especially if they're triple pane. What are casement windows? Casement windows are some of the most energy efficient windows that you can get. I would encourage you to point those out whenever you see them on a showing. Casement windows close in on themselves. So the crank windows is, is what you might call them. The parts can wear out because of the cranking and oftentimes that's what needs to be replaced, not the actual window itself. But if you keep it clean and you really lubricate the hinges, they'll last a lot longer. They definitely cost a little bit more to go in up front, but remember energy efficiency here. So here's that cranking mechanism. And when they come in on each other, they completely seal and it makes it more energy efficient. You're not getting air movement through it or that's kind of coming out the top or the bottom. And they're better for water resistance as well. Anytime you have a single pane or a double hung window, I'm gonna show you this. Usually there's a little channel down here in the window for any water that might splash back into the frame to, to exit out through the window itself. It'll be slightly sloped and you'll have little little channels right here for any kind of water to kind of funnel out through that. Those can get clogged up sometimes if that window faces is getting hit with wind all the time. So just a maintenance tip for you or for your clients, 
uh, if you have those channels in this type of window, whether they're single hung or double hung, make sure that you're cleaning those out at least once a year. So One Lena, time. Can I make a comment about single hung? Sure. So yep. in older homes, like if you're looking at homes in Minneapolis or St. Paul or like homes that are built in the 1900s, if they like early 1900s, if they still have their original windows, a lot of times they're going to have a storm window on the outside. So it might be a single pane window, but then there's going to be a storm on the outside. Um, it's typically has its own like metal frame. It's mounted to the house. Um Sometimes it's glass, sometimes it's screen, or maybe it has like a thing that you can switch out, but it adds a little bit of energy efficiency, but not a ton, I would say, but it, they do a really good job of protecting the window. So even if you have a super old window, if those storms are in good condition and they've been protecting the window for the life of the window, they can really extend the life of the window. It's just not maybe super energy efficient. Yep, I was going to talk about that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, sometimes people think that storm windows being on a window, especially in the city, means it's a it's a bad quality window. Storm windows can actually be great. And then I want you to think about this too. If you are looking or your client is looking for a way to um, upgrade energy efficiency, they don't have to take the storm window off. They can just replace the single pane with like a, a dual pane or a double pane window on that same sash without doing anything to the exterior storm window. And that would give even more energy efficiency or protection from wind and water. Thanks for bringing that up, Nicole. Okay, moving on, I wanna point out um, a couple different styles that we have left. So sliding windows, um, it's where both sashes are gonna move from left to right on slides. Um, energy efficiency wise, it's pretty moderate. I would say it's in line with single and double hung. Um, they're, you know, the tracks are needing regular cleaning because they can kind of get built up with dirt. If you think of a sliding glass door, that's just a really big sliding glass window. Um, costs vary on this, but again, they just slide left and right on a track. Awning windows kind of tip up on a hinge. Sometimes they have like a little crank out hinge where you can lock it open like this. Um, those mechanisms are more prone to wear, so they can wear out and come with a little bit more maintenance. If you're lubricating and keeping them clean, that they're going to last longer. But it's really good energy efficiency as well, because it has the same effect of a casement window. When it closes down, it closes down completely on itself. So it's creating a full seal on the exterior, and that's great for energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Here's a look from the inside as well. So you're similar, it's almost like a casement window, but on its side, so to speak. Okay, and then bay windows versus bow windows. I, I highlighted these for a reason. Um, there's a difference between the two and I just like to let you know kind of what some of those differences are. So bay windows are gonna have three or more windows that are projecting outward. They're separate windows and they create a shape, right? Like a hexagon, um, never seen an octagon, but more often than not, it's typically three or four of these. And a lot of times a picture pane might be in the center, which I have a, a photo of kind of further down in the outline as well. They are more expensive and complex to install. Sometimes they'll come with a window seat here or a window box. Sometimes they kind of protrude on the outside of the house and have an overhang that goes over the foundation itself. They are definitely more expensive and then it really just depends on the type of window. So these right here look like double hung windows where the top and the bottom move and all three of them move. Whereas if they were casement style, you know, the, the middle one might not open at all, but the two side windows might open. Now I want you to look at kind of like how this is three separate windows, each at an angle, right? You can see kind of this angle here of how it's shaped. A bow window creates a solid curvature, right? So there's no break in that. Think of a um, bow and arrow and kind of like if you're, the bow itself has a nice smooth um, curvature to it. It's the same with this window. 
And that's how you tell the difference between a bay window and a bow window. Same thing, you're checking for seal integrity. Is it's expensive, um, energy efficient because they're usually a casement style window as well. Uh, I think I've only seen one or two that I've ever shown that have um, sliding or not sliding windows in it, but um, it would be like single hung or double hung windows in it. A lot and of times there's a picture window here as well. When we're talking about the window price, is that like for the whole, like the five windows in that bow total, 1,400 to yep, 30? So that would be like a, a package. Yeah. No, not, not individual window for the whole entire package itself. That does not necessarily include installation cost, by the way. It's going to vary depending on the provider, but these windows, because they're custom, tend to be more expensive. I would say that if you have that whole thing replaced, say that you have like an old window system in there and you want to put in like a new vinyl window or a new, um, like a new crank out, it's probably going to be four to $5,000 to replace the whole thing, including installation, if not more than that depending on the size of it. I yep. have that window and, and I got quoted 20 to 25 K oh to my have mine replaced. Yeah. Someone's yep. ripping you off. That's pretty <laughs> expensive. But again, yeah, it's, it takes expensive. more to do the installation work because look at the channel on the, uh, look at the work that goes into this exterior. So this here is called J channel. It's designed to, you know, for a, a trim that keeps water away. Anytime you have it bowing out like this of the structure, you know, there might be an awning or something that's needed over the top of the window. All of those things are going to be factors in replacement cost. I wanted to show this picture because this is a dramatic bow window. It's beautiful. You'll see that a lot on like Victorian style um, or colonial style homes. Uh, it's a statement piece, right? But there's a lot of work that goes into creating this curvature. And that would definitely be something that is a lot more money to replace. Uh, okay, picture windows, depending on the pane, it can be pretty energy efficient. Um, they're just these large panes of glass here. It's very common to see them surrounded on both sides by windows that do open. The picture window itself is stationary. So this piece of glass is not going anywhere. It doesn't open. Windows on the side likely do open. Some picture windows are bay windows like this one is, but not all bay windows are picture windows. Some picture windows will have seat boxes like this or window boxes, not all will. And then I just wanted to show you an example of what that looks like from the outside. Very easy to see, something you could point out on your way into the house. Oh, look at that big picture window. It's gonna let in a lot of natural light. Okay, let's talk about foundations. A um, Couple key things, frost line in Minnesota. That's the depth that the groundwater and the soil is expected to freeze. Anytime that you're building foundations, you have to have footings that go below the frost line. And in Minnesota, it depends. Half of our state is at a 60 inch depth in the north and half is in the uh, 40 inch depth in the south. The uh, greatest depth is kind of up in the Iron Range area here in St. Louis County. It's the second deepest frost line in the country at 80 inches. It means the ground will freeze down to 80 inches. That's pretty significant. A um, little fun fact for you in case that ever you're looking for talking points with your clients, right? Um, here's a map I included for you guys so you could see all the counties. This is current. If you are in these counties here, you're at a 42 inch depth, 40 to 42 inch depth for the frost line. And up here, it's going to be 60 inches. Okay, so let's talk about types of foundations. Concrete block. Um, you've probably seen this before. Everybody knows what concrete block looks like. It's oftentimes reinforced with rebar. If it's done right, it's reinforced with rebar. Um, each one of these is called a line. So each time that you stack a line of blocks, it is referred to as a line. And I wanted to point that out because if you have ever done showings before with an open basement and you see a crack that goes all the way kind of along the brick between lines five and lines eight. That is almost always related to backfill pressure when they fill in this area here. It has something to do with the mathematics of the construction of block foundations, but clients will point it out and say, hey, is that a structural integrity issue? Should I be concerned? 
No, it doesn't mean the foundation is falling apart. It likely means that there was just backfill pressure between lines five and lines eight on that wall. And I don't think it's, it, in most cases, it's not anything that has to be uh, repaired, right? You could certainly lightly seal up some of the cracking in the mortar, but in my experience in construction, it's always related to backfill pressure. If you have huge gaps in the block, that's a different story. If it's hairline cracking, that's one thing. Or if it's zigzag cracking, that's something entirely different as well. I wanted to point out efflorescence. If any of you have shown a house before that has this white stuff on the walls and people wanna know what it is, it is not mold. Efflorescence does mean that there's typically water seepage coming in from behind the block. And what happens is as it's coming through, it's picking up all the minerals in the concrete itself, and then it's drying on the outside of the wall or the inside, I guess, of what would be the basement wall. You can scrub this down, you can treat it with some block lock, you can seal it up. But ultimately, if you see efflorescence like this, it is not mold, so clients don't have to freak out about it. And it is something that's fixable, maybe through putting in drainage systems on the exterior. And then again, block lock to really seal that out. Poured concrete is pretty common foundation. Um, it's seamless for the most part, right? Strong and durable, it's water and air um, airtight. I have a concrete foundation like this, it gets pretty cold in the basement. Um, you're checking for cracks. It's installed by putting it in sections in the forms here, which is why you see these lines in it. That's just from how it's filled in its concrete form. It is reinforced throughout with rebar but it's extremely durable. And it's one of the most common foundation types here in Minnesota. It's actually more common now than block. Block is a little bit cheaper to install, but can be more labor intensive sometimes. Just something worth pointing out if you're touring different style homes with your clients. Insulated concrete forms is a really unique style of foundation. I've only seen this a couple of times. It's not, it's gained popularity over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. But what it is, is you have these, these um, forms right here. They're waterproof insulation forms. They're heavy duty. They're reinforced with rebar. And the concrete gets poured down inside of that. So this is what it kind of looks like inside. And then you're pouring the concrete right down inside of it. If you see this, you'll know. Um, you can tell on the exterior of the foundation. Sometimes uh, some of this foam or insulation is showing up from the basement or along the grade level of a house. If you know your, your topsoil has kind of washed away a little bit, some of it might be exposed. And then if the basement is unfinished, you're seeing this um, foam layer on the inside. So misconception, if it, this foam does not come out, right? It is part of the, it's interlocked together and it is part of the foundation itself. Highly energy efficient, very, very durable, expensive to install and there's minimal maintenance on it. And just um, in case you ever show this and people wanna know, well, how do I finish the basement? Do I have to put up two by fours? No, actually the design of this found, uh, foam foundation, you can just tack your paneling right to it. You can screw in sheetrock or drywall right to it. So you don't have to build the wall out farther with two by fours and lose a bunch of space. Just so you guys know. Okay, slab on grade foundations. We are seeing more and more of this with certain builders here in Minnesota. DR Horton is putting up neighborhoods all over the place that are slab on grade, do not have a basement. Um, elderly people may prefer that there is no basement on a house. So we are seeing more slab on grade foundations in Minnesota. And what does that look like? Well, here's an example of the installation of slab on grade. There is always going to be a pier, especially here in Minnesota, that goes down on the frost line. And that creates this whole framework here that they're doing that's below the frost line. And then there is typically some kind of like gravel or grade that's compact down here that creates a base. And then maybe some insulation as well that's put on there to prevent um, frost exposure. And then the concrete itself is kind of laid on top of that frame. So you can see here on this one, like there's a line right here, right? Of where that frame's gonna end. And it and on this particular picture, you can see that as well, where it's sort of overlaid on the top of it. 
Slab on grade homes, it's really common to see in-floor heating as well with those. So keep an eye out for that type of setup in the garage or in the utility room if you're showing one of those. Because again, of the expansion and contraction below the frost line, slab on grade sometimes comes with the risk of the ground movement underneath, right? And that's the reason why it has to go on top of a found kind of a perimeter like this that is set below the frost line. This will ideally help it from moving when you have that um, freeze and thaw effect of the ground and not crack the slab itself. Wood foundations, is this the end? It is the end and I'm gonna be on time, that's amazing. Wood foundations, um, I just sold my first one this year, this last year, excuse me. I had never come across a wood foundation before. Apparently they are still a thing, even here in Minnesota. More common in some communities to the south uh, or southern part of the United States where it's less prone to freezing. But just wanna give you some characteristics of that. It's less expensive, easier and faster to construct than um, putting in concrete or putting in block. The wood can be susceptible to rot and to water damage. So there's processes that kind of go into how that's installed to prevent that. And you wanna make sure that you've got good drainage systems around the perimeter to prevent water from, uh-oh, um, prevent water from going back along the foundation and risking the potential of pooling at the bottom and rotting some of the wood. It is less durable, but the benefits are a really fast installation process and less expensive. It's always gonna be pressure treated wood. So it's gonna be either a brown treated or a green treated type of wood that's used, makes it more resistant to moisture and pet rot, uh, other way around, pests, rot and moisture, excuse me. And then waterproofing, there's a coating that kind of goes on the wood. Um, Drainage, as I mentioned, is really critical. And then there's a vapor barrier as well that will either go on the exterior as well as interior. So here's a couple of pictures of what a wood foundation would look like inside if the basement was unfinished. Literally below grade and you're seeing plywood instead of concrete walls. And then this is what it looks like on the exterior before it's filled. And their moisture barrier has not got, gone up yet. In the event you see those, highly, highly, highly recommend your client has the right type of inspection uh, to protect themselves from the risks that could be associated with this type of foundation. I got two minutes for questions if anybody has one. Is that wood construction anything people are doing new in new construction at all? It seems like shoddy. <clears throat> I haven't seen it in new construction. Um, my house that I sold last year was built in the mid to late 90s. And the couple other ones I've heard of where I've, I've actually seen on the disclosure now were also built in the 90s. What I know is that there was a lot of experimenting going on with building in the 90s. So homes were buttoned up super tight and had a tendency to have moisture issues and mold problems. That's why you're seeing a lot of air to air exchangers now and higher radon levels in some homes that were built in the 90s. Um, and there was a lot of code changes that occurred between like 1995 and 1997. Maybe that had something to do with it while they were trying to figure out more economical ways of building homes. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen any homes that are more recently constructed as in within the last 20 years that have a wood foundation. Okay. I would ask those questions though, Johnny, if you see that come up on a house, like look for the year it was built and ask if it has a moisture uh, barrier on the outside and if they've had any kind of inspections and if they have a drainage system in place to prevent water intrusion. Those are really critical with this type of foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up so we can get our team meeting starting here um, in a couple minutes. What I will say is next week with question and answer, if there is any particular area that really stood out to you over the last few weeks where you want more detail or you think um, you'd benefit from a little bit more information, please reach out to your sales coordinator and let them know. They have access to the outline as well. They're all experts in selling. 
I'm happy to answer any questions I can as well. And then we can keep a list going of maybe questions to address next week. I'd like to talk about some mitigation systems next week as well, like radon, or what to do if you see asbestos, how to identify that, um, mold, another issue, um, how to take care of mold and, and mitigate situations like that. Maybe revisit seeing um, cracking in walls. Uh, what's structural versus cosmetic? You know, if we're talking about structural cracks, they're going to look a little different than cracks that go on lath and plaster walls, which we briefly touched on um, last week. So those kind of questions, any of those things that come up for you or that you've experienced during showings and just didn't know how to answer for your clients, please make a list of those and give them to your sales coordinator. Thanks everybody for attending. I hope you learned even one or two little things today that could help you out and give you more information to talk with your clients about while you're out doing showings. Remember that being the knowledge broker and taking great care of your clients will ultimately lead to more sales. So the more you're willing to learn, um, the more of an expert you're going to become. And I support that. I'll see you guys Thanks, soon. Thanks, Thank you so much. Bye. Team meeting in two.